We're back. We're very excited about this show. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. The handsome fellow on the other on the other window is Carlos Juarez. Uh, <laughs> and he's in Austin, Texas today. He moves around a lot. And uh, he's he's a he's an expert in international relations. He teaches that subject in the University of the Americas in Puebla. Yeah. And uh, so, um, you know, the title of our show is The International System After the Pandemic. And let me add some words on that. After the pandemic and under Biden, because um, that, you know, we are in a new time. Will the pandemic and Biden, I suppose, lead to a new world order, such as the liberal world order we saw emerge in favor of the United States after World War II? A very important moment in in history, and we have kind of lost that, but maybe there'll be a resurrection here. Welcome to the show, Carlos. Aloha, Jay. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to connect and reconnect. And of course, in many ways, we're just picking up a conversation we've been having for quite some time. And that is, obviously, we see the international system in some ways in crisis and chaos. And it's not just the pandemic, which is obviously today uh, we we we. We, we marked the one year um, anniversary of the formal uh, announcement by the World Health Organization. Uh, and no doubt we're already beginning to, you know, see transitions in that pandemic. But beyond that, what is the world going to look like, you know, in two years, in five years, in 10 years? But keep in mind, um, we're also seeing a, a, a global, I guess, international order um, facing transitions and change. And let me suggest this, that I think it can become more stable and durable, but it requires in some ways a greater role uh, and, and, and more commitment from a broader group of nations. And what do I mean by that? The United States, yes, it's an important player. It will continue to be, but it's not going to be returning now that we have a transition to the new administration that is, you know, trying to reconnect, trying to emphasize multilateralism. The U.S. cannot participate in the same way of, of the past. It has to be more humble. It has to be more uh, a seat at the table with many other players. And, and, and we, need a, we need a seat at the table, but it is a different world. You imply that had we not had Trump as the president, had we not dissociated ourselves from so many alliances and relationships, um, we would be in better shape today. We would be more influential, more powerful today. We would not have lost the, the, the mojo that we had before. Is that- No, would that no, no. Sense? I would say not. In fact, what I think what we can say is in some ways, look, even before Trump, the United States was already facing a lot of discussion about a relative decline, obviously the rise of the rest, the emergence of new powers. Uh, and so the U.S. also no longer the dominant hegemonic role that it had. Uh, keep in mind, you know, after World War II, the U.S. helped to establish this current, you know, international system. The, it was an open and rule-based international order. The United States very much at the lead of it. Now, it took on a very geopolitical connotation throughout the Cold War, right? The first several decades, uh, I'm, I'm being simplified here, but uh, the Cold War ends, the US is still the big power. But the last 20 years, we've seen just a lot of changes, uh, the rise of China in particular, but so many other little, uh, let's say, uh, uh, points of, 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 of power, uh, you know, Brazil, uh, Russia reasserting its role, the European Union itself, basically, uh, you know, a, a more important player. And on and on. But bottom line is that we, we with Trump, we saw a sudden, very dramatic break from that, uh, a shift away from the multilateralism, the traditional commitment. It was a rupture. It was a, it was a, you know, the world was shocked and dismayed. Now, fast forward, Biden comes in and we're trying to reconnect. And, you know, that's seen as ideal and favorable, but it's not going to go back to where we were. And I guess I'm suggesting that I think even the United States needs to realize that the future is one in which we need we need global cooperation. I think that that's become clear now and the pandemic has underscored that. Uh, in other words, cooperation is a necessity and it's also something we have to invest consistently. It's not a luxury we can just uh, uh, not afford. Uh, so the pandemic has, has made clear that we need certain norms and rules and certain institutions, you know, the World Health Organization. You don't leave this you know, global, uh, you know, organization in the middle of a pandemic that that's a disastrous decision well uh, you know on that i you know i would i would throw the thought at you that that um, agree that before trump it was there was a decline in the world organization not only in the u.s influence in the world organization sure but in the in the, the whole liberal order in general 
I mean, just just some anecdotal thoughts about that is that you know there, uh, Ai Weiwei and uh, human flow and uh, seventy million people and behind barbed wire with no prospect of leaving, um, no education, no health care, and they, they will die behind barbed wire. Seventy million people like that. Now, certainly, somebody you know, some moral force in the world should address that. But the United Nations wasn't addressing that. Recently, um, what's his name? Uh, Bashar Assad. Mm -hmm. Bashar Assad. Bashar al-Assad, yes, Bashar in Syria. Al -Assad, yes, Syria. Um, you know, was, was nailed for um, torturing children, you know, 10, 11 year old children, torturing them with, with no point, just torturing them. I mean, just completely hideous things, atrocities. And there was a move to uh, put that matter in the, uh, the, the atrocities and some kind of criminal justice, in, international criminal justice in the International Court of Criminal Justice. But because of the way the United Nations is formed, um, the Security Council has to do it. And the Security Council includes Russia and China. And both Russia and China, for reasons that really escape me, maybe geopolitical reasons, who knows what, they voted against it. So that was never turned over to the international. And nobody is taking, no part of the United Nations is taking any action, uh, you know, to to stop uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad. So you say, you know, this is a defective organization. This this has this has a lot of work to do, um, to, you know, put the world right. And, you know, and, and I guess another another issue is, is COVID itself. I mean, we, we don't have a, a democratic distribution, global democratic distribution of vaccines. Um, and the World Health Organization has been, you know, I don't know, less than effective in that regard. And Trump heard it terribly in, in all these remarks. Um, so bottom line is, you know, we need, we need a real United Nations. We need some organization with power and influence and money and troops for that matter, to quell disturbances. We're miles away from that. And if the liberal order were to have continued properly after the war, Second World War, it would have been much more robust, robust today. It is not. Do you agree with me on this? Well, um, I think, you know, I share a lot of your, your, your sentiment, but what I think it's a challenge is we are not going to get world government. The UN is not going to have, you know, a, a rapid reaction military response. At the end of the day, and this is the harsh reality, it is realism, it's real politique. Countries looking out for their interests, the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans. And we're speaking primarily of the major great powers. Uh, a small you know, country, even a medium-sized country, doesn't have that capacity. They don't have veto power on the Security Council. Now, the ability of this is ongoing debate, you know, can the UN change, can it reform? I don't see that in the cards. And at the end of the day, you're not gonna have that. You're not gonna have world government. What are you gonna have and what do you need? Well, you need cooperation, you need coordination on many things. And again, the United Nations itself is not the solution, but it is on some level, it is a forum for certain things. And take the World Health Organization. Again, not a perfect institution. It's only as good as the, you know, the people who work there, contribute, who, who, who cooperate with it. But no doubt the United States, such an important player on even in just understanding of infectious diseases and, and you know, housing the best you know, the minds and, and, and the research. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, long considered like the, you know, the role model for public health uh, ministries, took a severe beating under Trump. I mean, he, you know, himself uh, politicized it. And so much like that, the United States in this most recent Trump administration, very much rejecting multilateralism. I mean, uh, it, it was a shock to the system as well. Now, Back to Biden. I mean, he does offer an opportunity for the U.S. to revive some of the commitment to this liberal order, but it has to be understood that it's going to be a, a different role. I want to say more modest, you know, listening more. Um, and you know, he's already acknowledged on one hand uh, a more willingness to listen, and and that's going to be critical, and, and to engage in meaningful discussions with traditional allies. I mean, the U.S. should be talking to our allies, but even our adversaries, um, and and you know, and clearly renewing the participation in many of these supranational international organizations. The I guess US that's must, the reality of it, but that's the reality of it. I mean, you can't deny that, but it puts us just a little further, you know, for the U.S. to, to be humble and, uh, and you know, be sort of, one, uh, sort of a, a, 
a humble a humble member of the of the group um it puts us a little further from world government doesn't it because before well, we had the chance as as being a very influential member to get up there and do global leadership and say for example we have a problem in climate change this planet has to act together or we will we will surely be destroyed um and we don't we don't have that leadership now and we certainly we can join up on the, on the paris uh, agreement but that doesn't mean that the world the united nations or any group of nations is going to really put their shoulders on behind the wheel on that yeah and and listen one of the challenges we have to also acknowledge the united states is today deeply polarized and even throughout its history it has always been divided between uh a, a, I want to say a smaller, maybe minority who are, well, no, let me rephrase it that way. Let's say a faction who are very strongly international, global in the orientation. That has never been like a big majority, but certainly for those who, let's say, uh, more elites and those who deal with international affairs, yes, uh, the U.S. Is, should be there. But there's always been a strong isolationist element, a strong, uh, you know, and, and it goes back, you know, from the founding, it goes back through the experiences of the world wars, through the experience of Vietnam, especially, uh, and endless other, you know, more recently, the war on terrorism. So my point there is that it's, well, it's a, it's a paradox. On one hand, global cooperation is, it has broad popular support and it must have it because you need public backing for multilateralism in order to sustain the political will to maintain it. So if Biden or any president wants to engage, you've got to make that case. You have to explain and build support for it. And that's not always easy. But at the end of the day, we do see evidence now, public opinion surveys indicate support for multilateral institutions in general, but in particular high for you know, those that are specialized like the World Health Organization, especially in this COVID uh, you know, period. Uh, but I go back to this, the United States remains crucial in global cooperation, but not in its current role. Uh, I, I see here that uh, this new, this shock that this, you know, let's say the, the COVID, but even that the Trump, uh, you know, shock uh, to the U.S. political system, uh, it means that the U.S. you know, can, can no longer carry on the hegemonic role, the sort of big bully, although it'll always be there, uh, but it has to somehow be a little more modest and, 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 and I don't know, I mean, it's easier said than done, but the, the, the dominance that it has long had is, is not possible for it to, uh, to continue, uh, I want to say. I don't, I'm not sure we deserve to you know, be a global leader. Um, because we haven't been a good global leader anyway. We, as I was saying, my view is that um, we could have solved some of these problems that we, yeah. the, the world, but we didn't. And the United States was in a position to lead on that, but it didn't. And you're right, we were fragmented. And we're more fragmented today than we were 10 years ago, I think. And we may continue to be fragmented and uh, our government may be dysfunctional. It is right now. We can't get these these initiatives through and everybody agrees they're good initiatives, but they're not getting through and they won't get through. And we're distracted and fighting them are all the oxygen is being sucked out of the room by these political battles in the next election and so forth. So <clears throat> I don't think we would have, you know, as much respect and influence as we would need anyway to be a global leader on these global issues. The question then is if we are humble, and if we are conciliatory and try to make deals and try to talk nice, um, you know, what happens to the notion of leadership by power, which is what it was? Uh, what happens to that? Does that mean that we have to fall second to China or Russia or a combination of China and Russia? Uh, or will they just um, you know, veto, our, veto our plans and initiatives in our leadership any day, all day. Is that what's gonna happen here? Uh, if our plans uh, obviously go against their interests, yes, and that, that's gonna continue, uh, the Russians and the Chinese in particular. Uh, the US has to rebuild uh, relationships that have been severed and, and that requires time and trust. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, let me suggest that as much as we may have these important ideals of cooperation and sort of this liberal order, I think we, 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 we see again and again realism comes into play. Countries, powerful countries, always assert that. And, and the United States, again, even under Biden, there will be situations where the U.S. is going to basically carry on its bully role. It's going to be aggressive. It's going to take actions that aren't seen as favorable by many in the world. Uh, that's 
part of the baggage that comes with being a big, big, powerful actor. Um, <clears throat> let me just uh, maybe continue the idea. I mean, uh, I, I want to say that cooperation is going to be necessary because there's no way around it. And, and history has shown us again and again that global pandemics, for example, are likely to recur. This is not, you know, this was not a big surprise. We knew it was there. We even had a playbook. Of course, uh, the past administration threw it out the window. And so, uh, but the point is that we know it's going to occur and that global cooperation is, is key to mitigating them. Um, you can see, interestingly, in, in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, and other parts of Asia where the, the lessons of a decade ago, the SARS crisis, uh, the H1N1, it gave many of those governments and, 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 and societies an experience that helped them manage this one better. Uh, that, that, that seems to be an important lesson that we're drawing. And it was through the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, this multilateral framework. And let me suggest that the future is not going to be the United Nations, you know, world government. It's going to be more of these regional uh, schemes, uh, whether it's the Europeans. Of course, they've got problems and challenges. It's not perfect, but they have to solve their problems regionally. North America, today we, we must recognize uh, the Canada, US, and Mexico are deeply integrated, uh, especially as a production platform, the economies. Now, maybe the social and cultural, uh, there's a challenge there with Mexico and the US. Canada and the US are virtually you know, seamless, right? Uh, in terms of uh, cultural values and, and, you know, economic development and the like. But what I'm getting at there is I think we're going to continue to see regionalism, regional solutions, but that is multilateralism. That's cooperation because we can't get around that. We can't seal the, the country out. Pandemics don't uh, obey, you know, visas and restrictions on the border or ethnic differences. Uh, and pandemics are going to continue to be a reality for us. Part, part of this is this, uh notion of international democratization, um, such as the thing with Syria, such as uh, we, we can't tolerate immorality uh, or amorality. We have to step in and whatever is in the tool case, the toolkit, we have to try out something uh, to, to minimize, um, you know, the kind of disparity, disparity in, in, in poverty and in, in hunger, disparity in disease, disparity in, you know, discombobulation. And, you know, we have climate change and climate change, uh, you know, results in migration. Um, in fact, all change results in migration. And, and look what happened to Europe. I mean, it really hurt Europe to have all these people come and they weren't prepared for it. They weren't willing to accept them and created, you know, governmental issues and social issues and business issues. And it's, I think they're not out of the woods on that. So the question is, you know, how does the world in this new order, I call it new order rather than new liberal order, because I don't think it's so liberal, it's more like siloed, but how, how does the new order deal with those issues of philanthropy and humanity and being humane and helping people and taking them out of uh, barbed wire fence, you know, camps and, and, and stopping the atrocities and all that stuff. You know, and, and with disease, with with food, with agriculture, with saving people, or or is it simply not care? Um, I, I'm I'm concerned. There's nobody going to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we have to be realistic. It's not something that's easy to solve, and we're not going to have governments just suddenly coming forward and you know taking care of it. Increasingly, we see a lot more civil society groups, the NGO sort of non-governmental sector is key to this uh, uh, on, on many of the challenges that you mentioned, whether it's environmental or food security or different human rights violations. And let me just in terms of speaking quickly about this world order that is evolving, the liberal world order, if we call it that, that emerges after World War II, um, at least in the first several decades, focused primarily on security and economics, you know, stability and building, rebuilding. Uh, and that was in the 50s and 60s. By the 1970s, it began to shift to human rights. And we begin to see uh, both, you know, not everybody going forward. There were a lot of countries in deep political crises, economic crisis. I mean, think of, you know, Central America and, you know, the, the ongoing violence in the 70s and 80s, right wing military regimes in South America. Most of the world in the 70s and 80s, uh, the developing world was authoritarian systems, some variations, right? So human rights become more pronounced. Now, I'm moving quickly and oversimplifying, but the 1980s and 90s, we have waves of democratization. We have more open societies, but we have more awareness of, of all of this and more connections, you know, this globalization agenda of the past three decades, especially. The flat so, world, the flat yeah, world. 
exactly. And, and I want to say at the end, I mean, we have to be realistic that there's not going to be one simple solution. There's not going to be a world government. Instead, I think we, what we have is a growing, uh, you know, virtual communities, growing experiences across borders where, and, and this, I think the pandemic, again, coming back to that, has only helped to accelerate that. That was already happening and, and, and you know, convergence uh, of interests and values. But now we have an accelerated process. But even in the midst of all that, we're going to continue to see very, very difficult situation. Look, Central America today, deep, deep inequality, injustice, uh, political corruption, uh, you know, and, and there's no simple solution to that. Is the solution just to build a wall and close it out? No. Is, is it to help them develop? Well, yes, but good luck because we've spent billions of dollars. Most of it has gone to military and security, and it has simply helped to, you know, continue the, the corruption there. But what's the alternative? Again, it's not closing out. It's having to try to re-engage and to do it more people to people, civil society. And uh, you know, again, th there was a woman who came and I saw her talk at the Pacific Club here in Honolulu. And uh, she was from, uh, mm, I think, Harvard Business School. And she said, you gotta, you gotta build this into your thinking. Says, These, you, it's, it's about the money, uh, the money flow. Uh, and, and in today's world, um, money is influence. Money is power. Governments, many governments don't have money or they have less money than the multinational corporations have. Way less. And, and for that matter, NGOs that are well-funded by philanthropists, they have a lot of money and, and they can step in. Um, she said, you know, don't, don't expect a lot from governments when the multinationals you know, the ones that really have the influence you can make a schematic on that. You can see, you can prove it up. And I, I didn't forget that. And I do feel, and you mentioned NGOs a minute ago. Um, I do feel that in recent years, where the vacuum created by governmental unwillingness, one reason or another, NGOs and multinationals have stepped in. And they, they have their own ethic on this. They may decide to do this project, but not that one. But in general, I think they, they all have valuable projects and they all, they're all doing, in some ways, good work. Um, and I think maybe that's the future of this. A query though, are they responding to the United Nations or are they operating on their own? Or are they, to, they, are they collaborating? Or are they just like Bill Gates? He, has, he comes up with an idea, he does it himself. He doesn't need anybody particularly, not a lot of collaboration on that. Um, and query whether these uh, multinationals are doing it in their own silos or whether they are you know, coordinating in such a way that you could say that they're doing a world order of some sort. Well, I, let me quickly answer by saying all of the above. I think you have a mixture of that. And yes, there is collaboration. Even you know, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, obviously through their foundation, but they are also very active collaborating with particularly the NGO world, but also the scientific community. Um, we'll maybe have to continue a dialogue in the future more about this pandemic uh, response, the global response, because uh, back in, I'm going to say in May of last year, uh, there was the creation of what is known as COVAX, which is kind of a, a network bringing together, you know, the research and, and, and uh, uh, you know, vaccination production, but the logistics and distribution and also the financing, very important, so that this is meant to address the inequities and the challenge of poor developing countries who cannot negotiate with pharmaceuticals, who don't have even the capacity to buy the medicine. At the end of the day, this pandemic will not be solved until the global community addresses it. And that, again, this COVAX, it's, it's just getting started. And obviously uh, the developing world, the poorest countries are gonna be on the tail end of this. Uh, but uh, I, I gotta say that because I think in the end, it's all gonna be about collaboration and it's gonna be thinking outside the box. Government is not gonna be there. World government is not gonna be there. The UN does have a role on some issues, primarily as a coordinating function. It doesn't have a rapid reaction, doesn't have endless money. It's only whatever the members who choose to pay contribute, but it has a wealth of experience bringing together the players, the NGO community in particular, and increasingly the private sector too. There, there's a role for business. And again, it's not all positive or favorable, but in some ways it is you know, a large corporation. But as a final thought here too, I mean, the pandemic, it's going to get worse and the inequality that we know exists in the world is likely to get worse even in the years ahead and it's not just between countries which is one it's within countries uh, and especially 
in a lot of developing countries, uh, this pandemic is going to exacerbate some of that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we're going to have to see how can there be more learning, more cooperation uh, to try to address some of the worst of that. But uh, in the end, it's going to be all of the above. Yes, some individual actors on their own, some governments picking up the slack, but civil society groups, NGOs filling in some of the void. As well. And some surprises, you know, when, when you have a vacuum, you, you have surprise players coming on the stage. Sure. Uh, we had we had a show um, a week or two ago um, uh, with a with an Indian woman in Europe who coordinates um, vaccines that are manufactured in India, um, and we find out that uh, India is is very um, productive on vaccines, and One they have largest. perfectly workable vaccines that they are distributing everywhere. But the most interesting part of that discussion to me was that India, like in the way of governmental soft power, mm -hmm. India wants to make friends. So India takes these developing countries and it gives them the vaccine in a, in a very noble gesture. Now, maybe they have in their minds later they want to do trade and, and sell stuff. Sure. Um, but they, have, they want to show the world that they have a philanthropic side to them. Um, as a, you know, it's a country or or maybe a pharmaceutical company, one or the other, or both. But they're doing this as a elemosinary experience. Mm -hmm. I say to myself, maybe that's the future of the new order. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I think you 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 hit it there very well. And that again, these are going to be new examples, thinking outside of the box. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to have to come back with another show in the future, looking at this whole pandemic nationalism and and how it's become. Uh, in this case, like you example, the example you've given, a, a form of soft power so that India, this important emerging power, what does it have? It has tremendous uh, capacity to develop pharmaceuticals. It's the largest, as I understand it, the largest producer of vaccines in the world. And uh, they've been doing a lot of the testing of some of these uh, and production of some of these newer ones. Uh, and yet it's a mixture of obviously very large private corporations in India often closely connected to the state. They get support and, 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 and you know, investment uh, as well. Uh, and the government of India, very much this is part of their, you know, their global connection, let's say. Uh, they're not a, you know, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it goes on even beyond that, uh, the, the vaccine nationalism that we're calling it. Uh, we're seeing it in so many places, uh, you know, in Europe right now, uh, uh, deciding to ban uh, exports to Australia or whatnot. Um, scandals everywhere about, of course, the abuse and misuse of, of the of the vaccination program. It's brought down already ministers and some political systems in, in South America and Peru has been facing a big vac, vac they call it vacuna gate, like vaccine gate, uh, because it's already brought down a few foreign ministers. Uh, for, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, government ministers. Yes. You know, one other thing, Carlos, we should talk about is uh, is Joe Biden. You know, wrapping wrapping around all of this, all of mm -hmm. you know the the, the history, uh, the current situation, and the fragmentation in our mm -hmm. in our in our uh, our our, rep our reputation in the world and all that. Mm -hmm. um, the possibilities of collaboration, the condition of the UN. Um, what what should Joe Biden do? Not only to be uh, a re-entering member of of the club, you know, the international power club, if you will, world order club, mm -hmm. but also to do good things, uh, to make sure that that club does good things, and to make sure the United States does good things. I mean, to me, he's got a lot of tasks on his desk. Uh, in, a, in a moment of time, you may not think this is the most important, but in many ways, it is the most important. What should Joe Biden do to realize our destiny in, in world leadership and in, you know, helping people? Yeah, well, real quick, I, I mean, I think one of the things that he has to do in, in both the U.S. and I think he's in a good position to do this is to help diversify the leadership portfolio of both the US, but also the international community. And, and look, at the end of the day, Biden is very well suited to repair a lot of these strained and broken relations uh, he, and be able to work collaboratively with, with, you know, with different, I mean, it's in his, uh, let's say it's what he's done. And he is reasonably well regarded. He may not be as charismatic, as dynamic, uh, as, you know, uh, 
uh, or popular on, on the level of, let's say, uh, Barack Obama was with, with particularly a lot of European leaders. Uh, but uh, I think he does have a lot of that. And, and back to the main point is that um, I think that what he can do, much like he's trying to do even with the U.S. government today, is to have it reflect uh, the diversity and the values of the U.S. And, and I go back to this idea of being more modest. It also means to be a better listener. Uh, the U.S. has a tradition of being very arrogant and sort of self-serving and, and you know, the why, the, it's our way or the byway. You need more modesty and more humility. And he's done part of that already by assigning, you know, uh, the, the leader, I can't, her name is off, not on my fingertips, but the new UN ambassador, uh, you know, a long career diplomat, uh, African-American woman. Mm -hmm. And I would actually mention one last thing that's interesting. Um, uh, it's a little bit under the radar, but you may recall Susan Rice, a former uh, a national security advisor for Obama and UN ambassador. She was appointed by Biden, not to a national security sort of foreign policy she was domestic policy right she she's in part of uh, and and that is a curious example of how we we need to think outside the box uh, today foreign policy and 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 let's say the u.s role in the world can only be strengthened if we take care of our house and 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 connect the domestic and 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 and, and really link those two you cannot delink them and so i just go back to this what can biden do well obviously take care of the house but also help to diversify the leadership, both of the US, which I think he's done on some level, but even at the global community uh, uh, level, uh, giving recognition that, let's say, new emerging powers have a voice. Uh, he met last week uh, in a virtual meeting with uh, President uh, Lopez Obrador of Mexico. And in that, I mean, again, it's more for show, but he tried to say, hey, we see Mexico as equal. You know, he was using language that I think, at least from Mexico's point of view, that's better than the confrontational view that they had from Trump, which is you'll, you will do this or I will punish you with, with tariffs. So you need some of that more modesty and humility. There are signs of it, and it's not gonna change overnight, but that has to be the new reality for the US that we cannot assert dominance control. We have the answer, no, no, it needs to be, we have a seat at the table, we have a lot to bring to that table. Uh, and that's why I think we also need a refreshing of the, the leadership of our own foreign policy, uh, and that's happening now. Yeah, new times require new steps. Uh, we, are, we are in it already in a different world order. Thank you so much, Carlos. Carlos Suarez, thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to our next discussion. Aloha, Aloha. Jay, thank you so much.